we're kind of all really excited to kind of hear about your process, how you kind of work, and then we can kind of have a chat, I guess, about yeah, any questions we have and kind of have a bit of an open discussion. Cool. Um, sounds great. I'm super excited and honored to be talking to you all today. Um, I would say, you know, keep it. Um, I'll give a presentation, but if at any point, feel free to jump in and ask questions at any point. I want to keep it really conversational. Zoom is a little strange. <laughs> so, and like, for example, I can't see when I'm presenting, I can't see the chat, but if you want to ask questions in the chat, I will, you know, I, when I'm done speaking, I can take a look at them, but also feel free to just unmute. And if there's some, you know, um, it's a small enough group that if, it, if there's something that you want me to kind of dive into, um, and then yeah, I'll talk for probably about 25, 30 minutes and then have another 30 minutes for conversation if there's anything. Sometimes some other projects might come up or... Uh. So quick introduction to myself. Um, I used to look like this. I studied fine arts, painting and printmaking. I was really happy. If I could spend all of my time in the printmaking studio, I would. I had to get a job. At that time, everybody was talking about web design and Y2K and the world's going to end in the year 2000. And I got a job. I totally lied. I got a job in a design studio. I didn't have any design background. I came with like slides of my paintings. I was taking these meetings and I, somehow I got a job. And I discovered when I was there, um, this tool called Flash. And so sometimes I'll be, I think you're, some of you, I see some nodding heads. Sometimes I talk to like young people that don't know what I'm talking about. But Flash for me was this, yeah. <laughs> Flash was a gateway drug, right? It was as an artist, I had always loved animation and, you know, just so excited about making something move and seeing things in motion. And here was this tool that was all about movement, putting, putting animation on the web, but then you could also code with it. So you could, you could say, you know, X equals X plus one and the, the rectangle will move one pixel in it, you know, then the next frame, one pixel, one pixel. And I just fell in love. Um, I do all kinds of projects. I, I'm going to just um, describe a few and then I'll jump in and sort of talk about kind of my research directions. This is a project that I did um, over a decade ago with uh, Tempt. This is a uh, paralyzed graffiti writer. So he's a graffiti writer who has ALS. He can't move. And we built an eye tracking device um, and built a kind of low cost eye tracking system to allow him to draw graffiti using his eye movements. This was a project that I did with Toyota. They have this small car called the IQ. It's like a smart car and people think you can't drive it quickly. So we hired a stunt driver uh, to drive letters of the alphabet. We put colored dots on top of the car and then made a font completely out of driving. Um, this is a project that I did in New Zealand um, at the ferry terminal building in Auckland where we took your, it was a projection on a building and most building projections, you see the building kind of fall apart and there's all this sort of visual effects and we wanted to use people's bodies. So here you come with your body and we show you as a character, you know, four or five stories high. A lot of times I find myself doing just extremely random things. So this is my friend Daito Manabe. We're hanging out in a, this was in Belgrade in a hotel lobby around like 1am and we were, um, I was tracking the movements of his face. So trying to figure out when, when his face was moving and then projecting on his face in, in real time. So using sort of face as input and output. Um, and I can't imagine what people who are like in this hotel were thinking about us. Uh, this is a project that I did a while ago with um, Goal 11 is one of my longtime collaborators. This is taking an overhead projector. So this is a kind of projector that your math professor would write notes on you know, and, and a digital projector and combining them to create a kind of hybrid light source. So a mixture of both analog and digital light. And then the way it works is you make a shape and when you release it, it makes sound. So it's a kind of audio visual instrument. I don't know if you can hear. Thank you. 
Um, and I'm also a teacher, so um, I kind of divide my time evenly, sort of one third making artwork, one third doing commercial work, and one third teaching. And for me, those are sort of three legs of a stool that I think helps me have a kind of balanced career. And in terms of teaching, I'm a professor at a place called MIT Media Lab. It's a, just an experimental research center based in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I help run a group called Future Sketches. I also help start and teach at a school called the School for Poetic Computation. That's a kind of experimental school based in New York City. So I'm going to talk about some topics, some areas of research, things that I'm interested in or passionate about. One is drawing. So my background is in fine arts, and I found it so frustrating when I started to use the computer to make art. It just didn't have any of the qualities that I was used to. You know, if you sort of grew up sketching and doing ink on paper and watercolor, and you know, then you start to use like Photoshop or Illustrator, these tools, they're really, you know, rough approximations of what it feels like to use kind of natural media. And a lot of times the things that I was really passionate about when I started coding is thinking about how can I build drawing, what does it mean to draw on a computer? Like how could we draw in new ways? So I want to show a couple of um, projects that relate to that. So this is a project called Inkspace, and this is a drawing tool. You draw on a phone and it uses the accelerometer of the phone. So using the sensor on the phone to understand how it's rotated and um, then uh, that allows you to rotate the drawing so to make a drawing in 3d you're drawing on a flat surface but you rotate the phone the drawing And what I love about kind of building these tools is just seeing what people do with it, seeing the kind of drawings that people make, you know, oftentimes like very silly, kind of childish drawings, a lot of this, like, I love people just find a lot of really creative ways to write this. Um, but then there was this woman in South Korea who drew this bird, and I just fell in love with it and kind of can't even imagine how she drew it. And that's one of the sort of beautiful things about making tools and putting them out into the universe is seeing seeing other people's creativity kind of reflected and seeing the, the energy and enthusiasm that other people bring to the things that you make. Another drawing project that I worked on is called Landlines. This is a collaboration with Google. And they came to me and said, you know, we have these satellite photographs from the Google Earth project. It was like the 10 year anniversary. And could we come up with a creative way of navigating them or a creative interface for people to explore these images? And I built a tool um, where you draw and it matches a drawing. So if you draw a curve, it'll find a curve somewhere in the world. If you draw an angle, it'll find an angle. If you draw a straight line, it'll draw a straight line. If you another angle or a rectangle. And um, projects like this, they have this sort of pretty front end, but then a lot of the work that I do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, you sort of have the front end design and interface things to think about, but then also this back end work where you're thinking about the data and how could I recognize shapes and, you know, how do you come up with a metric or a distance metric for curves? And a lot of, I really love this um, uh, kind of art form because, I, every, you know, I'm, what I'm doing day-to-day -day is always changing. I feel like I'm wearing many different hats. The second part of this project is, um, <clears throat> ooh, sorry. Second part of this project is uh, called drag. And here you drag um, your finger and it connects the dominant line. So it finds like a river or a highway or a coastline, you know, in some photograph and creates a kind of infinite um, line. So it's taking all of these photographs and stitching them together to make a kind of a never ending canvas and these are real places so if you see some place which is interesting you could click on the link go to google earth navigate um and then another uh i mean drawing related project is um i got inspired by one of my students so yuki Yoshida is one of my students at sfbc and for his final project he was working on a book where he was trying to document all of the different ways that you can draw a circle using a computer 
So if you tell the computer to draw a circle, the actual algorithm, the code is more, is, is kind of complex. Like it's not, you know, there's different ways of writing it. And so he documented with the, the visual on one side and the code on the other side, showing you all these, these different ways of drawing a circle. And I thought of an idea and I emailed him and I got so excited that I coded it. And my idea was very simple. You start with a rectangle and you pick one of the four sides on the rectangle. And then you pick one of the three other sides. And if that line doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. But if it does intersect the circle, you don't draw it. So you're basically kind of drawing line after line after line and anything that hits the circle, you don't draw. So the more lines you draw, you wind up approximating a circle. So it's almost a kind of drawing of absence. Anything that's not a circle is drawn. So I got very excited about this. I tried some words. I tried the word love. Um, that didn't work very well. I tried a smiley face also not, not working so well. But I was thinking, you know, what if these lines were more like rays of light? What if, what if they could bounce? You know, and then maybe I could get like here, I can't see the inside of the, the E, like I can't see any of the space, but maybe if those lines could bounce. So I got quite excited about this. And oftentimes the, where I go as an artist are just driven by like my, here I'm frustrated. And then I was thinking, okay, let me try to code algorithms for light and reflection. What would it look like to reflect light off of typography? And just got, you know, excited about this and started sketching and sketching. Um, and got to a point where, um, so thinking about refraction and different techniques and got to, um, I, you know, just created numerous sketches on the, you know, the topic of reflection. And oftentimes the, the sketching turns into an installation. So this is a, a public art project that I created where I've set up a light table and I invite people to come and interact with this light reflection. So I've laser cut a bunch of pieces and you can set up the walls and the software is simulating what it would look like if light was bouncing off of these shapes. There's a camera that's looking from above and you could press a button to change the lighting mode. And what I love about projects like this is they sort of start with your body. So you come, you put down shapes, you see yourself, you know, reflected in the system, but then it kind of goes to your brain and then back to your body. So it sort of starts with the body, but then your brain is trying to figure out, you know, how does light work and how could I reflect it and trap it? And then it goes back to your body and the sort of body mind body pathway, I think is really powerful. Um, I have been doing a lot of projects around the body and trying to understand, um, you know, if we have, if the computer can understand that there's a human there, how can we augment it in interesting ways? How can we understand movement? And for me, this is a kind of fascinating territory, sort of experimenting with the boundary of perception. Um, and I've been working with my partner, Momo Kuo, where we're taking the, um, the, her, her movement and her choreography and trying to add a kind of visual layer on top and thinking about, you know, almost what, like what with a computer, what is a new form of costume? What is a new form of augmentation that we can create? So lots of, um, experiments. Um, and I love, uh, sort of thinking of the body as a starting point and then seeing, you know, what kind of layers of abstraction we can apply to it, doing kind of even simple geometric things like um, this is uh, uh, rotating the, um, the body. So almost like revolving it like on a pottery wheel or something and seeing sort of what forms come out of it. Um, attaching physics, spring systems, blobby shapes. Um, again, also like one thing that I'm really interested in is uh, what, you know, when do we see a, a body or not? You know, when is it, um, when is a body visible? So thinking about kind of even the sort of threshold of perception, sorry, keynotes like 
crazy slow. So I keep <laughs> like not able to advance it properly. Um, all right. So like, yeah, when do you see a person? When do you not see a person? To me, that boundary of perception is a really interesting territory, like sort of playing on, you know, when does it look like a, a human? When does it, when does a typeface look like a letter form, et cetera? Um, this is a project that I did with um, the author, Margaret Atwood, where she had a new book coming out called Hagseed and her publishing company involved me in an installation. I, here's when I met her. So working with her was like working with um, Beyonce. It was like really, like I would email her publishing company, would like email her, her agent, would email her assistant and then her second assistant. And she would say something. And it, would like, it was like really like complicated to communicate with her. Um, but then, uh, I, then we met at the South Bank Center and this, we posed for, this is right, right when I first met her and she stole my hat off my head, um, which was really funny. So, um, we took the, for this project, we took the text from her book and we mapped it onto your body. So the way it, it works is you approach it, just a like public art installation, you step forward. And then there are different scenes from the book that we took the actual text, the language of the book and used your body you know, sort of combine the text and your body at the same time. And you can perform the ideas to give you a feeling through the animation to give you a feeling of that moment in the book. Um, and it was really fun to, um, you know, it's like in the lobby of the South Bank Center. So you just had, you know, hundreds of people come by, um, happen on it. This was when I was installing this guy, like wouldn't leave. Um, this is the night before the opening. So I still have my laptop still out. I'm like adjusting code and he wouldn't, uh, he wasn't uh, playing with it. Um, and what I love about something like this is that the, um, the book was all like the really about solitude and feeling alone, but this kind of project, it worked with one person at a time, but if there were multiple people, you actually had to hold hands or touch each other in order to be registered like the the software would only see one person at a time. So it almost like combated, it was, it was so beautiful in that it sort of combated some of the themes of the book. Like it brought people together and it brought like, it was just so much joy to watch people experiment with this. This is a project that I do with the New York Times where there's a big problem in America with opioid addiction, like people getting addicted to heroin and you know, their opioids. And for this article, the authors interviewed hundreds of addicts about what it feels like to get addicted to, um, to opioids. And, um, and then what we did is we took the language uh, from these addicts and we commissioned a dancer to dance out these different kind of like what your body feels like. So to interpret with her movement, the, the quotes from these dancers, and then we um, analyzed the, her movement and then Try to figure out kind of what is our visual forms that we could create that would respond to the text that would live with the text. And so the way this article works is a kind of um, it's text, but then there are these like interstitials which are animated based on kind of the the movement of the dancer, but also the language and the responses from these former addicts uh, about what your body feels like. So this is gateway when you start to take the drug, and then. Um, tolerance when your body kind of builds up a tolerance for the drug withdrawal what you feel like when you stop taking the drug addiction when you have to keep taking the drug to maintain the sort of baseline treatment when you start taking medicine to deal with the side effects of not taking the drug Relapse. And then recovery. And it was really exciting. Like I do so much stuff on screen and it was so exciting to like run around Brooklyn and buy every copy of the New York Times. Like, my mom was really proud to have this like big spread in the paper. Um, this is a Mosque de la Car is a public art project that we did in downtown Houston, where we installed screens in, um, this is like a, used to be an old department store, but now it's abandoned building, or it's like a parking garage, like the facade of the building's still there, but the, the building is not inside, they just park cars. 
And for this project, we were really inspired by Bruno Minari, who has this spread in his book, Design as Art. This is like amazing spread showing you all the different ways that you can draw a face and that you don't need a lot of visual information to represent a face. That because our brains are so wired to see faces, just a few squares for an eye and a you know square for a mouth, like you can see a face. And there's also this concept of periodelia, the idea that you can see faces in things. Like in America, if you look at a power socket, it kind of looks like a face. I don't know about UK. Um, and, uh, and then this is a museum in Japan of rocks that look like faces, which I really want to go to. This is the rock that looks like Elvis. Really want to see this. Um, and I just, when we were working on this project, we just fell in love with the culture and the history and the kind of just language of mass generally and how different cultures use mass to tell stories, to, you know, share folklore and, and you know, um, to me that mass are just really exciting territory, some artists that work with mass. We, um, when we were working on this installation, we did uh, workshops with local school children. So every time we went to the city, we would work with school children with laser cut, you know, cardboard pieces and make masks. And that's like the most fun I had working on this project is kind of jamming with children, then taking their ideas and bringing it back into the software. And the visual form, we really wanted to focus on this kind of Bruno Minari style, like simple graphics, simple visual language. We're all really used to face filters, face augmentation, but can we focus on the sort of graphical form? And the way this installation work is almost like a poster where when it finds your face, it zooms in, and then your face is a backdrop for a kind of living poster. So it kind of like zooms in on your face and then adds a graphical layer on top. Sorry. And again, we really want to focus on this kind of very simple graphical form, sometimes like playful storytelling, like with the face. <laughs> bring it, bring it. So me saying what I'm saying to you now. Um, and the way this installation works is you kind of walk forward and when it finds your face, it just adds this layer on top of your face. And when you cover your face, it zooms back out. Um, and it was so kind of magical, like just seeing people play with it. There were about 60 masks and people would um, discover them. I one time I could log in and remotely watch people interact with it. And one time I saw a guy on a Segway and he would like slowly ride forward until the software found his face and add a mask. And then he would like go in reverse really slowly and it would lose his face. And then it would slowly come forward. And so it was so beautiful. Um, and then the last thing, a uh, couple of things is that I'm really interested in augmented reality. So what does it mean, you know, if you have uh, a device where you know where it is in 3D, to me, that's a really beautiful territory. What does it mean to have a camera in space? What does it mean to have a microphone in space or a screen or a speaker in space? That means we can start to ask really interesting questions. So I started doing these experiments, like taking a photograph and having the photograph stay in the air where you took it. So in the actual location where you took the photograph, the photograph sort of hovers in the air and you wind up making this kind of fragmentary images, like really kind of strange images where the image is just staying where it was taken. Um, or then you could do things like take frames of video and have the video stay in the air. So all those frames of video hanging out and then you walk through it to replay the video. So with your body, you're like the playhead of the video player and you can slowly go forward or backwards to play the video. Um, this is taking a photograph and breaking it into pieces. Uh, no. And then there's one vantage point where it looks correct. So taking an image, breaking it by color into regions and then exploding it in 3D so that as you move, those pieces are broken. But there's one, one vantage point where it looks correct. And then as you move it, the world starts to be more fragmentary. This is taking the color pixels that are in front of you. So grabbing the pixels, the kind of visual information from the world, and then drawing that back into the world. So almost like a ribbon where the color of the ribbon is based on the color that's in front of you. And for, for us, it was really important. Like at that time, everybody, this was like right when Apple released AirCore, 
And all these people were doing these demos of putting like, I don't know, like a stormtrooper in their living room or like putting a teapot on your coffee table. And it was all these like terrible 3D models and like really boring interaction. And one of the things that we were thinking is like, let's not bring in any 3D models. Let's not bring in any assets. Let's just say, if we have this power of knowing where the device is in space, can we just use what's in the world? Because it's so interesting. And, you know, and then that becomes the content that the world is the content rather than some assets. Um, again, one vantage point where things look correct, but as you move, it starts to be more warped. A lot of like extremely weird <laughs> experiments, just like visual form. I think AR is this kind of amazing vehicle for ambiguity, for creating just visually ambiguous works. This is recording audio. In so as you make sound, the audio stays in the air where you put it. And then when you walk, it replays. So the sounds that you made sort of hang out. And then when you walk through it, you're almost like scrubbing the audio. And we had these um, beatboxers come to the office and it was amazing. because they would like make a beat and then they would play it. They would like scrub it, you know, with the iPad and then like add another layer on top. It was pretty amazing. And then different experiments, like this is an app my partner and I made called Weird Cuts, where you take, you can cut some element of the world, like almost like a collage tool and then draw with it in 3D. So you can take photographs and put them in the air. And we love it as a kind of almost like doing new forms of portraiture. Um, we do a lot of just like experimenting and kind of messing around. And then I love seeing what people do with it. Like somebody made a sandwich where they took all the elements of the sandwich and then exploded the sandwich in 3D. Like they took all the pictures of the elements of the sandwich and then made a 3D sandwich, you know, and that's like the beauty of making tools is just seeing kind of what, what magic people bring to them. Um, recently, we've been doing a lot of experiments with the body. So trying to understand um, where the, the body is in 3D. And then you can do all kinds of trippy things like here, taking multiple photographs and compositing them together and getting almost a kind of, yeah, new form of portraiture, weird stuff. This is what we do all day is just mess around, write software, <laughs> mess around, see what happens, try something else. Sometimes we wind up with these things which are like, we don't even know how to explain. So this is recording looping video in space. So you wind up with this kind of looping human form and I don't, I can't, I don't even know what's going on. Like I, I couldn't understand it and you can walk through it. Um, this is drawing with your body. So taking your fingertips and, and almost making a kind of web where as you move your hand, you're, you know, drawing into space, drawing into 3D, a um, little bit more like chromey solid form. My studio mates are really patient with me. I'm always running around trying to film them. This is like pre-COVID. Um, I'm always like with my iPad. I look really stupid, <laughs> you know, running around with my iPad. Um, but they're very patient with me. And they, yeah, um, I'm always like, let me, let me follow you. Um, and then usually you think about AR sort of adding a layer onto the world, but this is hiding somebody. So using augmented reality to hide somebody or mask somebody. And to me, this is a really interesting idea, thinking about kind of surveillance and um, personal expression. And, you know, I, I think AR is also a kind of interesting vehicle for something like this, where you could hide or just change the world in a way that maybe you can make somebody disappear. Um, Last thing I'll share, um, and then again, feel free to interrupt and ask any questions, is I love teaching. And I want to just talk about the school, um, School for Product Computation, which is a school uh, I helped start in New York City. And I teach a class there called um, Recreating the Past. And it's inspired by this book called The Art of Computer Designing by Osama Sato. Um, um, it's an amazing book. I fell in love with this book. 
um, about how you can use the computer to do design. I like read it cover to cover and it's just like full of all this kind of generative design ideas and just like these wonky graphics, like super cool 90s graphics. Osama Sato is an amazing designer, by the way. You should see he has a game called for the PS1 called LSD Emulator, which is like trippy and weird. And like he's this is like a designer that has a Reddit, you know, he's like he's he's, he's like a cult designer. Um, just super interesting. I fell in love with the visual forms, like super 90s just gets crazier and crazier just like these like super you know this visual language which i really love and then i was reading the end and he's thanking people and he said you know i would like to um thank uh you know my favorites the russian avant-garde futurism and, and bauhaus whose brilliant typefaces and designs have in many ways shaped my own mind if the artists of those movements were alive now to work computer to work with computers i'm certain they would discover new artistic possibilities the work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. In this sentence, I love this sentence so much. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. And I think there's just so much for students for teaching that's really important, this idea of recreating the past, of remaking the past. And so my class is about engaging with the past so every week I talk about a different artist or designer. So for example, Miro Cooper, who was the design director at MIT Press, she also helped create the MIT Media Lab and her group there, the Visual Language Workshop, were like doing the early work with typography in 3D, you know, and thinking about kind of type and anti-aliasing and all these things we take for granted. They were experimenting with and just exploring kind of what is the intersection of design and computation. Um, so my students, we study her work and my students have to recreate her work using modern tools or Vera Molnar, who's a Hungarian artist based in Paris. And since the seventies, she's been writing code to control a pen plotter to make drawings. So she does, she does these algorithmic drawings with code and we study her work. And then my students have to recreate her work using modern tools. So basically reverse engineer and make a new version of her work using modern software. And we were invited to show our work at a festival in Houston. And we suggested showing code and visuals side by side. So most time when you see artwork that's created with code, you don't see, you don't see the code, right? If you go to a website, you can say view source, but you don't see the source code, right? You always see the visual output. You never see the underlying code. We wanted to celebrate the text and the visuals at the same time. So we suggested that we show it side by side. So one LED screen that has the, the text on it and one that has the visual form. And when some number on the text changes, you see a corresponding change in the visual form. So the idea is that even if you don't understand code, if you're not a programmer, you can still understand that there's a relationship between language and visuals, between the, the words and the numbers and the visuals that you see. And, um, Here's a quick, so what you're seeing on this LED screen, these are homeworks that my students made recreating artworks from artists from the past. And we also made a zine so that if you come to this festival, you could learn about these artists. So maybe you're kind of enjoying the, the videos and then you have the zine in your pocket and come home the next day and be like, who's... And I really like this kind of just feeling, being able to see again, kind of text and language. People thought we were typing. We were like hanging out with our laptops that thought we were like typing the code live, which would have been very impressive. And here you can kind of see again some like when some line of code would change, you could see the corresponding change in the visual form. Um, the last thing I want to say is um, I was walking down the street probably about six months ago, a little longer, 
And in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, somebody had written the word COVID-19 in graffiti on the wall. And I, I was like, this is so terrible. It's kind of like, this was, this was, a, this was like a year ago, actually. And um, it was like being in a terrible science fiction movie, you know, where they're like, they have like set design, they like use gra graffiti, environmental graphics to like tell you what's going on in the plot of the movie. So I just felt like so miserable when I saw this. And then uh, I came by later and somebody had crossed it out and written the word hope. And um, that's how I'm, what I'm feeling these days. And just super happy to be here talking to you. I'm happy to answer.